What's up guys, this is Nurse Howie and I'm gonna to talk to you about how my second day of shadowing a CRNA went. So first of all, um, as you know, I am a sRNA hopeful, which means I'm, a, I'm trying to apply to CRNA school. But let me talk about what that means. That means a certified registered nurse anesthetist. Now, a lot of people don't know about this nursing job, but it's actually the guy or girl that puts somebody into anesthesia so that the surgeon can operate on the patient. Um, there's not a lot of, I don't know, information about it that I knew of. Uh, but a lot of nurses know about it, so especially a lot of male nurses, because a lot of male nurses go into the ED or the ICU. And the only CRNA students that can go in to apply have to be ICU nurses. So as you know, I'm already an ICU nurse. I've been doing that for a couple of years now. And if I apply now, then it'll be about three years that I've been in the ICU, because uh, if I do get accepted into a school, which I really hope I do, then I'll have... Uh, to probably just wait a few months to maybe a year for the class to start because it'll probably matriculate into the next year or something like that. So anyway, that's what it's like. And most of the time people enjoy uh, being a CRNA because you get paid a lot of money. Let's just put that right on the table. Um, everybody knows that most CRNAs make about at least 150 grand a year to 200 something a year. And that's equatable to many doctors' salaries. And also the best thing about it is is that you just put the patient to sleep and then you wake them up and then you don't have to worry about how well the surgery went because it's not on you to have a successful surgery, but it is on you to make sure that the patient is set up to have a successful surgery. Now, what I mean by that is that the patient has to be asleep and for most patients that are asleep, I'm sorry, let me backtrack. No, the patient doesn't have to be asleep, but the patient has to be pain-free. And sometimes, no, make that most times, the patient is going to be asleep. Does that make sense? Let me backtrack. Not every patient that goes into surgery has to be asleep. When a patient is asleep, then you have a, you set up the chances for a, a more successful surgery. However, it's not that easy. It, the whole concept in explaining it is simple, but you have to make sure that the patient is not awake during surgery. You have to choose the right amount of anesthesia to give to the patient, and not all patients are the same. Some patients are more frail, so you need to make sure that you adjust the anesthesia. Uh, you also need to make sure that the patient is uh, hemodynamically stable. What that means is that the vital signs that you're monitoring the patient, you need to make sure that they're still okay. And uh, I know one of the doctors on YouTube I saw, on, an anesthesiologist mentioned it as a train track. So basically your computer is taking vital signs and you, they'll usually show the systolic blood pressure, which is a top number, and the diastolic blood pressure, which is a bottom number. And the computer will start making charts of where it is. And usually it should be stable, so it'll start making ticks and it'll look like a train track. So all in all, basically you just need to make sure that the patient is stable during surgery, that they're pain free and they did not wake up and they didn't move. Now that again seems so easy, but it's not. There's a lot more into it because there are some patients that only do you have to make sure that they tolerate the drugs and the anesthesia that you give them. But you need to also make sure that they're airway is open so that you can insert a breathing tube in case the patient has to be asleep because sometimes you have to paralyze the patient as well which is really scary but ICU nurses are well versed in this uh, sometimes when the patient is very very let's say resistant to anesthesia or you don't have enough time to put the patient into anesthesia then you need to make sure that the patient is relaxed enough to be able to put a breathing tube and if you want to know what it feels like to have a breathing tube, you really don't. Uh, because remember when you were drinking something and then you somebody made you laugh or chortle or whatever, and then the, the liquid 
instead of going down into the tube that goes down into your stomach, went into the tube down into your windpipe or the trachea into your lungs. And how does your lungs react when there's anything, not even water inside your lungs except air? It goes crazy. And so you can't shove a tube down somebody's windpipe without them trying to punch you in the neck, you know, <laughs> or trying to retaliate. So you have to put them to sleep. And sometimes the anesthesia is not enough. You have to put in even more. So you have to give them a paralysis agent, which is scary because when you paralyze somebody, you basically take away all their ability to breathe. So you have a lot of responsibility. And another favorite anesthetist, um, nurse anesthetist of mine, she's on TikTok, follow her, Emily CRNA. She mentioned that being an in being an anesthesia, either as a nurse anesthetist or an anesthesiologist, is about 90% boredom and 10% terror. <laughs> if you've worked in the ICU, you know that things can be kind of smooth for a while, but once in a while, Something goes nuts and you can't understand why and the patient's blood pressure is falling. And this is what people see on, on medical dramas, but it's in real life, you know? But, and you have to figure it out right then and there what's going on. So the critical thinking that ICU nurses have is still rampant and still a very useful technique for when you're going into um, anesthesiology. Now, I was shadowing alongside a medical student and a resident, and one of the medical students, I, the medical student said that he was hoping to go into anesthesi uh, anesthesiology to become an anesthesiologist. And I told him, oh, that's great, that's wonderful. Um, when do you think you'll find out? And he said that he will try to apply the cycle after, right after medical school, so probably in his fourth year, if I believe. And he was hoping, but he also has a realistic view of it that he may not because it's such a competitive uh, field. And he may go into flight, uh, flight medicine, which is where you help out with critical care in transporting patients via a helicopter. And then he would reapply back to anesthesiology or anesthesia. And I told him, I was like, wow, that's a long time because if you don't make it, then you have to do something for three years and then come back. And so it'll basically take you like 10 years to get back if you don't get chosen to the specialty right away. And then I kind of felt bad because I told him that and um, I thought maybe I was dashing his hopes. So I thought about it more. And then when I came back from break, I said, hey, listen, not to make you feel bad, but when you do come back and if you're not chosen into anesthesiology and you have to become a flight, you know, a flight physician, then you're going to be so amazing and you're going to have all this skill and knowledge to go into anesthesiology. And, you know, if it makes you feel any better, I came from becoming a corpsman, which is a medic in the military, to getting my license, vocational nurse license, which is like a practical nurse. Then I went to become uh, an RN with my BSN, uh, but before that I had my biochemistry degree, and then I became an RN with a BSN, which is a Bachelor of Science in Nursing. And now I'm here shadowing next to you. And just that alone has taken me 15 years to get there. So, you know, I hope you, the, I wish you the best, and I hope that you get chosen into anesthesiology. But if you don't, just know that it. It, there's a lot of people that have taken three times as longer as you have just to even stand here next to you to talk to you. So I think that made him feel a lot better because that guy was really young. He was like 25 or whatever, so but he was buff. Um, I guess that's what they do in Florida. It's just a very big football college, but he was smart as a whip, brilliant guy. Anyway, let's start before I ramble on. Um, Let's start with CRNA shadowing day two. Now, if you saw my video previously about shadowing day one, you'll see that I had no idea what was going on with surgery. I thought that, I don't know, the patients were wheeled onto you, you put them to sleep and anesthesia, uh, anesthesia and then they, they operate and then they go, which is kind of what it was, but it's a lot more intricate than that. And additionally, on my first day of CRNA shadowing, I didn't see a general anesthesia. 
which means that I didn't see somebody go to sleep for anesthesia. Usually they involve blocks, like somebody, I saw somebody get an epidural, uh, which uh, many women get during labor and delivery for uh, when they're pregnant. But I also saw somebody, uh, like men get it too, uh, because they have intense pain or if they're trying to block a certain part of the body, but not all of it. And so they got, that's more of a, I also saw like a spinal block, which is like a short term epidural. Epidural kind of lasts there with a catheter in your, in your back a little bit longer so they can deliver more anesthesia and um, pain medications to you. Whereas the spinal block, they just want to block the spine um, from any pain for, or they'll block the spine corresponding to whatever part of the body that they want to um, anesthetize. Um, so they go into the different part of the spine to anesthetize it. Does that make sense? So My point is is that I didn't see any general anesthesia and it was required for me to shadow to find one So when I came back, I really told my preceptor and she is amazing. I really look up to her She's a nurse anesthetist and she trains medical students and medical residents and something that I'll, I want to talk to you about too is that um, when I was shadowing next to a medical resident, you know, she had, the medical resident had more skills to do because they actually could lay hands on the patient, whereas I was just a shadow and I was only observing. But anyway, my preceptor is amazing and I really admire her. I think she is top notch. Um, otherwise, she wouldn't be trusted with training other medical, I uh, training medical students and she's a nurse, but she's training medical students and medical residents. And I told her that I needed to see a general anesthesiology, a general anesthesia, because a lot of the times, if something happens during surgery, and you usually prefer to only partially anesthetize that part of the body, but if something happens and there's a panic in the operating room, then we have to probably switch to general anesthesia. And so, there's these intricate things that you have to do before you even get the patient into the OR. And so one of the first things that we do is that we prep the patient by assessing them in the, in the um, I'm sorry, the, the surgical bay first. So this is before even we, we have surgery. And I watch them talk to the patient, get to know them, make them feel better. But they asked them a whole slew of questions that were very specific to anesthesia. They would ask them, hey, do you have any um, allergies? Have you had any reactions to anesthesia before? Has your family had any reactions to anesthesia before? Because I guess 1% of the population have some kind of genetic disorder or they'll react violently to anesthesia. Um, uh, malignant hypothermia or something like that and so you need to screen these things out and then you have to check out their allergies because you're gonna give them some medications to help them go to sleep and maybe some antibiotics and also you're gonna give them some post nausea medication post operation nausea medications as well then you're gonna ask them to open their mouths and they're gonna look into your look at, you're gonna look into their mouths to see if they have any loose teeth or if they're a more larger person if their their neck is is more uh, is very short, so you might have uh, more difficulty inserting a airway tube or an endotracheal tube. We call it an ETT or an LMA, which is another airway type of tube. Um, and so you need to suss all that out before the patient even comes to you into the OR. So we did that, and then. After that, we, before the patient came in, we had a huddle and they talked about, everybody stops what they're doing, everybody's very busy, but we go in the operating room and we have a huddle. And the circulating nurse, which is the RN, that kind of oversees uh, the equipment and the, you know, the circulation of the room, makes sure everything goes uh, smoothly. Um, he or she calls out for a huddle and then we all introduce ourselves. Oh, I'm you know I'm the physician. I'm going to be working on this patient. We're going to be doing like a right 
hemiarthroplasty, blah, blah, blah. And then we go down the line, oh, I'm a surgical tech, or I'm a circulating nurse, or I'm a nurse anesthetist. And then they talk about their anesthesia stuff. And then I'll just say, hey, I'm Howie, I'm Nurse Shadow. <laughs> I'm an RN, but I'm a Nurse Shadow. So uh, one thing that I also noticed that, by the way, I just want you guys to know that I have no clue really what's going on. So if you feel like I say something wrong, put it down in the comments and tell me that's completely wrong, Howie. Like if you're like an anesthesiologist watching this video or a nurse anesthetist watching this video and you're like, that's completely wrong. Just know that I'm shadowing and I know nothing and I'm just watching, which is why I'm shadowing, okay? So if I talk about something and it's completely off kilter, let me know in the comments and I'll try to read up on it so I can learn more. Anyway, so uh, during the huddle, my nurse anesthetist preceptor definitely knew her baseline vitals for the patient. And usually the, uh, the, um, the pre-surgical nurse, when the patient is waiting to go into the operating room, they take their blood pressure and they get a really good blood pressure. Now, if this blood pressure is completely way out of the atmosphere, like 190 over 90 or whatever or one over 100 200 over 100 then obviously they're not probably not going to be under surgery because they're not stable but if they're a little higher on the totem pole like let's say um of blood pressures so look let's say they're like oh 140 over 95 then you can start to kind of realize that when the patient is going to get um these medications and they're going to be put to sleep sometimes their blood pressure will drop or when you're inserting the endotracheal tube, sometimes the blood pressure will rise. So you kind of want to know exactly what their baseline vitals are, and that's what she kind of like keeps in touch of. She puts it on her paper and makes sure that she's familiar with the patient before she even brings the patient in. And then, um, but this is different for kids. Kids are actually more resilient, uh, and it's their heart that can last for a long, long time but their lungs will probably fail pretty quick, which is kind of opposite of adults, but we'll talk about that later. I shadowed some kids, completely different. Newer video, we'll do another video on that. So then we decided, um, then she decided the optimum anesthesia for the patient. I'm still not familiar with all the anesthesia, but there's um, intravenous anesthesia, which is what I'm more familiar with as an ICU nurse, and then there is volatile gaseous anesthesia, and there's like a gas machine that she operates, and most of the time she favors uh, sevoflurane, which is, they call it SIVO, but there's a couple other ones too on that machine, they're huge, like, and you can see that they're they're connected to the wall or to the, the ceiling, and that's where the uh, gases are coming in, but they're invisible, so you have to keep tabs on that. But there's isoflurane, desoflurane, and sevoflurane, and apparently she favors sevo for this patient. Then um, she already decided on what airways to give the patient. So because we did the pre-assessment, then she set up the tray and made sure that the, that all the equipment that she needed was available and she has this rule called one up one down and always ready to go because this will be another video uh, this resident was very smart and she was great but she didn't have the airway prepared so when the patient started to fail anesthesia and crash when she was attempting the airway she didn't have the tubes ready to go so sometimes the patient's you feel like they're a good size and you choose a certain endotracheal tube or LMA or whatever, airway tube, but if the patient for some odd reason doesn't work, you might want to go with something lower and smaller to be able to just get through those vocal cords to get into the windpipe, which is a trachea. And it just wasn't happening. So always be prepared. So she was prepared for that. And then um, she explained to the patient, you feel a touch of pressure, but no pain. Of course, uh, IVs are also already situated and um, hooked up because we did that pre-surgery. So going back to pre-surgery, they definitely asked, here's some of the more questions that they asked. If the patient had a previous nausea or vomiting, 
uh, especially with general sedation, and if the patient vomited, what anesthetic procedure caused it. You know, just because the patient is not tolerable of a certain anesthesia technique or drug, uh, doesn't mean that they're not gonna wanna go through the surgery. You just have to switch it up and know what is appropriate for the patient because not every patient is different. And that's the fun of anesthesia, I guess. Uh, and what does the patient take for GI symptoms? Is the patient on protonics or any other PPI, prevacid or all that stuff? I'm not quite sure why, but I'm pretty sure that it's because you don't want to have a patient have any gastric reflux. And if the patient ate or something like that, or if you assume the patient had a full stomach, as if, um, as in if the patient is coming in on an emergency, then you'll want to know if they're taking any um, gastric medications. And then review the vitals again. Just check the last vitals, check the last blood sugar, the results of recent pregnancy tests if the patient is of childbirth, potential and the height and weight. Okay, where were we? So we review the vitals again, and then we explain what general anesthesia is. So again, if the patient is only getting a partial anesthesia or a block of some sort, then we also get consent for that, but we also get consent for general anesthesia in case there's an emergency and we have to switch to general anesthesia. Then we explain the type of anesthesia that the patient's going to use. And then we check to see if the patient already got um, an antibiotic. Usually it's ANSEF that we've been giving lately, which is a type of antibiotic that we give to the IV. And then we ask for any smoking or tobacco history. This includes vaping because, I mean, you can do whatever you want with your life, but let's just say it out there, put it out there. Um, smoking just damages your airways and damages parts of your body and just changes your body physiologically, so you want to make sure that this patient is a smoker, how long, how many packs a day, and if they've, you know, they've had any problems with it. And to see if they have any apnea history. Some patients are usually that are larger have problems um, sleeping and they, they end up kind of holding their breath. This could affect how you give them the anesthesia when they go into the operating room. So you want to know their apnea history. But people who aren't obese or larger may also have apnea, just based on the way their anatomy is built. Um, do we need to give Zofran? Sometimes some patients and some nurse anesthetists prefer to give uh, Zofran, which is an anti-emetic and anti-nausea medication before they, they, they come into the operating room. And apparently one of the student, I, one of the graduating student uh, nurse anesthetist told me that Zofran is becoming more and more useful for a slew of other things that are off-label, um, but it's all beneficial to the patient during surgery. Uh, sometimes some patients also get a scopolamine patch behind their ear prior and after anesthesia and surgery because it helps kick in right when the patient goes home so they don't vomit on the way home. And that's a patch behind the ear. And does the patient need co-loading of fluid? Uh, we don't always want to use blood pressure medications to bring the patient's uh, blood pressure up when it falls when we put them under anesthesia in the beginning, uh, which some anest anesthesia drugs cause a low blood pressure. So we'll try to support the patient's blood pressure by making sure they're hydrated. So we start giving them fluids. So they co-load them with fluids. And that also helps with the blood pressure as well. And if there's any problem, we can bolus it, which means that we can squeeze a bunch of um, or, or really dose the patient with extra amounts of fluid should they need it. Now, the equipment that they, they use were a simple mask. Not every patient, thank goodness, have to have a, a breathing tube down their throat. Sometimes you can just put a little mask, just a regular mask in their face. Uh, usually, I think this involved a patient that just had a biopsy and we didn't need to put her all the way, you know, with it, with it, you don't need to, I think it's too drastic to put a tube down the patient's throat. So they just put a little simple airway mask and they just put her to sleep. And sometimes you can, um, my, my preceptor Jerry rigged the mask to have a CO2 detector because I forgot to mention CO2, CO2, CO2 is highly, highly important with patients that where we're, where they're respiratory dependent. And since we're putting them in and under anesthesia, then the, the lungs may 
give out or we don't know if the tube is really in their airway. Anyway, you need to have an antidotal CO2 monitor to make sure that you verify that the patient is breathing or having oxygen and having gas exchange. That's what the keyword that I want to say, gas exchange. All right, so moving on, uh, we check the IV pumps. The uh, pump is usually brought in with the patient and it usually has, like I said, the continuous fluid bolus or if the patient's getting intra, um, intravenous anesthesia like propofol or if they're getting something to help out with blood pressure such as neosinephrine or phenylephrine, sorry. Uh, then we want to make sure that the IV pole is ready to go. And man, there was an, oh, you know what too? I, and let's break that on another video. The pediatric patient that I saw that was under anesthesia, we have to use a special MRI IV pump and that thing was a crazy little piece of machinery because it was all plastic because you can't have any metal near MRI, so that was something else. Um, so be prepared to use a plastic MRI machine if you're a pediatric anesthetist. Uh, the bear hugger was then put on the patient and that is what we call a, a blank. It's like an, a, a heating blanket and it's made up kind of like paper and plastic and then we hook it up to this bear hugger which is kind of like basically a giant blow dryer and it blows up and it keeps the patient warm because sometimes the patient can get cold. It's a really cold operating room. It really is. Then they did the team steps pre-up. So remember when I talked about the huddle? Now they're doing something called team steps. And this might be a military thing, but I think it's being adopted everywhere else too. But they they use it in action to be able to make sure that, hey, once again, this is, I'm the doctor. I'm going to be doing this. So it's a little bit more elaborate than just the huddle because in the huddle we were just saying, hi, my name is blah, blah, blah. This time, we're serious. The patient is already anesthetized. The IV pump is um, going. The anesthesia machine is already going on. We've put the patient under anesthesia. We've evaluated that the patient is breathing, uh, breathing uh, using the respiratory machine, the anesthesia machine, and we've uh, confirmed that with an entitled CO2. Very important, that one thing. And then we also see the patient's blood pressures on the monitor right above the anesthesia machine. And we've seen that the patient is um, relaxed and comfortable. Even though they can't speak, we can see it on their vitals that they're within normal limits because we know what the patient's previous vitals were when we assess the patient before they went to the OR. Whew, lots of stuff. So this is the time to verify the type of anesthesia that the surgeon prefers for their operation. So you'll have to use your skills to kind of guide the surgeon to what anesthesia you're going to give them. And some surgeons insist on doing this. Um, that's what my preceptor said. And you as the anesthetist are skilled in knowing what medication and what anesthesia is more appropriate for your patient. So you kind of want to talk to the surgeon. And we all know that the surgeons aren't the, sometimes aren't the most nicest people <laughs> so you're gonna have to use your skills to be able to advocate for your patient and that's a nursing thing you need to stand up for yourself it's because a patient can't stand up for himself or herself so you need to be able to advocate for the best um, anesthesia because surgeons think that they know but they really don't at least that's what she told me <laughs> but I believe it I mean after all if the surgeons were experts in anesthesia they do it themselves uh, the first incision is something that you'll want to be aware of. Um, at this time, we started to relax a little bit, but uh, at the same time, the my anesthetist's ears were still perked up, and she was trying to see when the first incision, when the first cut was going to be made into the patient, because it's important. Not all surgeons are going to tell you, but you know, you kind of want to know when the first cut is made because if the patient is in pain even though you feel like they're in anesthesia their blood pressure could rise they could make a grimacing pain or the little you know hand might move or jolt or whatever that is a large large indication that your patient is not completely anesthetized or they feel pain again just because some patient is anesthetized does not mean that they're um, they're covered from pain you have to be able to have um, a pain medication to go along with your anesthesia. Very important. God, I wonder what the history is of 
how, what kind of nightmare <laughs> did they find out when that happened? Uh, then they did the first incision, yep. And then charting, charting, charting. You need to make sure a lot of these medications are controlled medications, especially um, opioids. And if you're, I guess they say, if you have any inkling of um, doing some recreation drugs or whatever, or if you have a little bit of a habit of partying, do not become a nurse anesthetist because there are so many drugs that you can get high off of. And they say that their anesthetists are like number one in, um, in getting high and stealing drugs. So they definitely gonna be watching you. So you chart everything. And you also wanna chart the patient, make sure they're hemodynamically stable, like I've explained before. And there's train tracks, you know. Um, and the vital signs are just stable and just staying in one place, you know, and just staying in the same direction on the machine um, whenever they annotate it. And don't forget to annotate not only every med you gave, but also non-anesthesiology -anesth meds like antibiotics and TXA, which I found is a medication they use to control bleeding and other stuff, uh, which is all, uh, sorry, TXA stands for transexemic acid. And then you don't want to double check that you have your emergency meds and your reversal meds ready, drawn up, and on standby. So before the patient even came, I, you know, of course you've set up your anesthesia machine, you put on your airway, you put on your your anesthesia medication, but also your reversal medications, which I believe is um, glycopyrrolate, and oh my god, I'm drawing a blank, uh, but. For me, in ICU, I use glycopyrrolate to, to prevent the patient from drooling too much if they're dying because we use that to make them make their deaths more comfortable. But in anesthesia world, they use glycopyrrolate to try to wake up the patient because it counteracts the paralysis. So it's an antidote. And then orders, you want to write and verify your orders, make sure that the timing coincides with everyone else's charting, that the orders can be invaluable in tracking this. You definitely want to have an OR nurse that knows the timetable because he or she is going to make sure that all the times are correct. So when you and the doc, the surgeon are charting, then you're charting in sync. So if you ever went brought into the court, you can say, well, this happened then, this happened during the first incision. And then when all hell broke loose, you have all your times all synced up. So medic, medical legal stuff. And then your discharge orders can be written down in anticipation of a successful surgical procedure. And then annotate that you followed and executed surgical interventions to prevent myriad diseases and disorders, such as um, SCIP, which I guess is an anesthetist version of the, the VAP, the VAP bundle, the ventilator assisted procedure. That's Remy, by the way. That is my dog. And he is so cute. And he is back there just lying down. <laughs> so. Finally, we're doing the peri check for continuously monitoring the patient. This is what we do while the surgeon is operating. You're just not relaxing, but yes, a lot of anesthetists, the joke is that they're always on Sudoku or they're just reading a magazine because yeah, a lot of it is just, you're just waiting for the surgery to finish because you just gotta make sure the patient's relaxed, asleep and pain-free and that's already happened. So now you just have to let the surgeon do his or her thing. And then, so you're continuously monitoring the patient. Don't just look at the cardiac monitor though, because although you should always have your eyes and ears attuned to its alarms, look at the actual patient, observe their face again for grimacing and body movements. And then check the IV side. Sometimes propofol can burn and the patients can feel that even when they're asleep. So you, she'll sometimes give lidocaine before she gives a propofol uh, because we don't necessarily need to put these, uh, give these patients uh, catheters, central catheters, which I'm used to in the ICU um, because the patients get so many medications through the heart. We do a central catheter and we thread the catheter all the way up their arm into their vein, their vein into the arm, into the, um, um, the vena cava, which is basically right by the heart and inside the heart. Um, and so we don't need to do that for anesthesia surgery patients because they're just going to go to surgery and then go home or go to the hospital. So, and then hopefully go home. So uh, we give the propofol through a peripheral IV, which means not just a small, this is the regular IV that you see in the hospital that um, nurses give all the time. And then you check the IV side, yep. 
Uh, and then we do team steps again when the surgery. Surgery's done. Okay, and then we do the team post-op, how the surgery went, blah, 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 blah. You know, and they talk. And then you wheel the patient. Your job's not done now, okay? You wheel the patient. You wake them up slowly. If you have to take out their, their airway, you take out the airway. And then you slowly wheel them to the post-anesthesia care unit, which is PACU for short, P-A-C-U. And I have another video for that because I went and um, worked at the PACU for a little while as a PACU nurse uh, with very little experience, but I learned a lot. And it's really fun <laughs> because I did it for Beverly Hills. And check that out in another video. Uh, and part two of this video, we'll talk about general anesthesia and a rapid sequence intubation as well as the APL valve. Uh, sorry, this video is quite long, so I have to cut it up in pieces. But I hope you tune in. If you have any questions, please put them down in the comments below. Um, let me know specifically criticisms or questions. I will try to find out for you. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please, please like. Please like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification button so you can know when I get my next videos out, okay? I will try my best to be consistent, but life, right? But I've been doing better, right? Like every two, three weeks. So um, definitely try to do one every two weeks for you for sure, okay? All right, thanks a lot, guys. Hit me up next time for a video on general anesthesia, a video on pediatric anesthesia, uh, video on um, bagging a patient which was oof, almost got the resident kicked out of the operating room and uh, my time in the PACU uh, which is the post anesthesia care unit so lots of anesthesia stuff for you lots of nursing uh, craziness okay and thanks again bye you guys nurse Howie out